Good morning, church. How you guys doing? All right. My name is uh, Wes. I'm one of the teaching pastors here, which is really weird because that's probably the that's the last time I get to say that. Uh, as as we get ready to do something pretty crazy, as me and my my wife Chelsea uh, and our our friends Noah and Julia, 23 days from now, we take everything that we own, which at this point is getting less and less and less as we sell more and more stuff to squeeze into an apartment together four people. It's like a sitcom. If you can imagine, it's two couples moving into an apartment where both the women want to be pregnant. It's uh it's like it's a sitcom. It's a sitcom. Um but it's crazy. It's so weird for me to think, man, in 3 weeks everything is totally different. Right? Everything that I have known, all of our family, every friend that I have made in my adult life, we move away from. And I've been thinking about that, and it's, it's kind of one of those things where parts of it are stressful, right? Like, parts of it are sad. Like, I don't think you guys even realize, like, how much I'm going to miss you guys. How much we've been through together. I, I've seen children born. I, I've, I've been with people as family members died. I, I've seen ministries grow. I've seen people come to Christ. I've, I've baptized some of my best friends. Like, it has been a journey, and it's one of those things that as this chapter closes, like, you know, you realize at some point this chapter had to close and a, a new one would begin, but it's still hard, right? If any of you guys, any of you guys like book readers in here, right? Have you ever, like, you've been reading a book and, like, one of the chapters is really good and then you turn to the last page and you realize it's almost over and you're almost like, I don't even know if I want it to end because this chapter was good. Like, I know the next one's probably going to be good. This is a good writer or whatever, but I've really enjoyed this chapter. Any of you guys ever experienced that before? Or like, I, d- I don't know if I totally want the scene to end. It's kind of like that. Like, I, I feel almost in the in-between. And it's a crazy thing to do what we're about to do, to move all the way across the country to uh, a people you've never met, to get ready to serve a, a people you've never known whilst deeply loving a people that you're around right now. It's kind of a, a crazy paradox to even be moving. And it's one of those things where I almost feel, I think in many ways, my wife and, and Noah and Julia would probably say the same thing. You, you almost feel like Peter getting out of the boat where you're like, I don't even know where these steps are going, right? Like every one of them is a shadow step. I don't even, I can't even see what it's going to look like because there's a storm all around me. So I can't see what's going to happen. But like, I'm going to trust God in the middle of it and I'm going to keep my eyes on him and whatever that takes, I'm going to do it. This is kind of what we're in the middle of. And I just wanted to say to you guys, man, I am so incredibly grateful for you guys. You guys have meant so much to me. All of you guys that, that wrote us um, a letter or, or put something in an offering, I, I can't even explain to you how much it means to us that, that you support us, um, that, that your hearts go with us to Portland, uh, that we know that we are, we are not alone, right? That it's not just the four of us, but we have all of you guys behind us. And I just want you to know, like, that is what family is, right? Like, we use that rhetoric a lot because we, we, we believe that it's true, right, Brett? Like, we believe that we are family here. We believe that it's true, but I think, I think this is one of those times where, like, man, I have felt it, like, more than ever, like, we really are family, and you guys really are there for us, and, and I just want you to know, man, I, I appreciate that. Anyway, can we get into it this morning? All right. Uh, man, this is going to get crazy. I'm just warning you ahead of time. Maybe we should pray ahead of time. We should, just, we should get our hearts right before I even start. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we are so grateful that we get a chance to be here. God, let us never be a people that take you for granted. Let us never be a people that take your presence for granted. God, let us never be a people that shrink you or compartmentalize you or think that we can put you at some little part of our lives, but God, let you always be the director of our lives. God, I pray that that you you do something to our hearts this morning. God, I pray that, that just like clay, you begin to mold it in some kind of crazy way that when we walk out of here, we do not look the same as when we walked in. We don't act the same. We don't talk the same. We look different to our world when we walk out of here because we have encountered God. God, let that be real for us this morning. In your name, amen. All right. Uh, can I ask you guys a question? Something that's, that's kind of been on my brain lately, especially as we get ready to do this, like I... You ever had that? You just have like a question that rolls around in your brain over and over and over again. This has been one of my questions. Uh, What influences you? Like as you think about your life, what influences you? 
Is it God? Is it music? Is it movies? Is it books? Your friends? Your family? Is it the church? Like, what influences you? Like, like literally, like, take a second and think about, like, what are the things that probably influence you the most in your life? And I've been thinking about that a lot because what influences you really determines, like, the direction of your life. It really determines, like, the choices you'll make. It determines what will come out of your mouth, the thoughts that will come into your head, right? Like, what influences you is pretty huge. Uh, this is the definition for influence, or at least one of them. It says, the power or capacity to cause an effect. See, influence will cause an effect in your life. It'll change something in your life. It'll move something in your life. It'll, it'll change the way you think, the way you talk. What influences you has an effect on your life. What influences you? Or what should influence you? See, I've been thinking about that, and I think a lot of us could say, like, out of that list, it's probably everything, right? There's a little bit of God in there, a little bit of music, a little bit of movies, a little bit of friends, a little bit of family. There's a little bit of everything. And I've been thinking, what influences me the most, though? Like, what is the thing that if I had to choose one thing that was going to direct the rest of my life, what would influence me? What would drive me? What would cause me to make decisions? What would cause things to come out of my mouth? And I thought in, like, the most simplest term possible, it is the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest story you can ever hear. It's the gospel. Which I thought was kind of fitting for maybe my, my very last week here to talk about the thing that, that changed it all for me and for many of us in this room, right? Is the gospel. And I was thinking, man, why is that sometimes so low on the list of influence? It's the greatest thing that we could ever hear, the gospel. But I think for many, it's an unheard story. I think as we get ready to go to Portland, it's an unheard story there. I think as we sit here in Des Moines, for many people in Des Moines, it's an unheard story. It's a story that has changed us, that has molded us, that has influenced us. But there are many that never heard this. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 9. Uh, if you have it on your phone, go there. I mean, I would just encourage you. I know I say it every time. I don't even care. If you don't have it, download it, right? It is free. Free things are cool. It is free. Download it. Read it along with us. I think there's something so powerful in reading the words as well. It, there's something powerful that it, it takes it out of just my control of what's coming out of my mouth, but like you're, you're actually in that category too, that you are reading the words of God along with me. I think there's something powerful in that. So Matthew 9, 1 through 7. Jesus stepped into a boat, and he crossed over to his own town. Some men brought to him, so the second... Look at this. The second he gets out of the boat, <laughs> the second he gets out of the boat and sets foot on land, some men brought to him a paralyzed man instantly. They bring to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this time, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming, knowing their thoughts. Like this... Man, this is like a moment where I feel like you don't mess with Jesus. Like, they thought it in their head. It was in here. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, knowing what they're thinking, says, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Uh, if it's me, both are difficult. Like, both, both are difficult statements. Like, I don't know if I totally feel comfortable saying, hey, all of your sins are forgiven. I also don't know if it's my comfort zone to say to a paralyzed man, hey, get up and walk. Like, neither one would be, like, in my comfort zone. For, for Jesus, they both are. He says to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. And then what happens? He got up, right? Like, he got up and went home. Let's keep that up there for a second. I want you to think about this. What happens here? This man is healed right? This man is forgiven. This man's life is forever changed in this moment, right? See, if you understand anything about the culture, when they thought something like this happened to a man, they thought it was because of the sin in his life or the sin of his parents. There was no understanding of like the medical aspect that went into it. They just thought you're being punished by God for your sin. You're being punished by God for the sins of your parents. 
In this moment, he is forgiven of his sins. He looks at him and says, don't you get it? It doesn't matter. I've forgiven you. He looks at him and says, get up and walk. He's healed. In this moment, his life is forever changed. And then this story ends, and I, I like, sometimes in my own head, like, I kind of wonder some thoughts. And if you guys do that, you, it's not written there, but you kind of wonder some things. See, what I wonder is I wonder if he ever went back to the temple. I wonder if there was ever a moment that he went back and prayed for someone else that was paralyzed. I wonder if there was ever a moment, right, because this, this guy is in the worst spot of his life. Every day for him is the new lowest day of his life. He's still a 45-year-old man begging for money, paralyzed, off on the side of the road. Every day for him is his new worst day. Would he be willing to go back and put hands on someone else that was in the middle of their worst day and pray for them? Did he ever go back and pray for healing for someone else? Did he ever go back to the temple and shout from the doorsteps, man, this God healed me. He did something miraculous. I can't explain it. I, these legs haven't worked for decades, and suddenly he said three words, and I walked. Did he ever do that? What happened there? Did he ever go back and do it for someone else? See, I would suspect that when Jesus said, get up and go home, He didn't mean stay home. But what do we do? We stay home. We love to receive, but it is so difficult for us to extend. Right? Like, we love to receive healing. We love when God does awesome things in our lives, and yet we're afraid to see it happen in others. We're afraid to put our courage there, because, right, because just like I said, It is not in my comfort zone to walk up to a paralyzed man, place my hand on him, and say, get up and walk. But if I had been a paralyzed man that had a hand put on my head, said, get up and walk, and I experienced and I felt it, would I have a different type of courage? Would I have a different type of calling in my life? See, I think we are called to go back to where we came from. What we do is we just leave wherever we were, and we say, man, I'm never going back to that spot in my life, and we let everyone else just sit in whatever rut that they're in. We say, I got my healing. I experienced Jesus. But I'm too scared to talk to someone else about it. I mean, I don't know if I want to say something to the lady in Starbucks that I can see like she's crying and she's texting someone and she's crying. But that's like way outside of my comfort zone to go sit next to her and say, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Like that's way too much. I know that I have experienced hurt and I know that I have cried and I know I have felt pain and people have been there for me. But man, I don't know if I want to be the person to do that. The story continues in verse 10. Then while Jesus was having dinner, so he immediately goes from this to dinner. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So you got to understand, so tax collectors, um, they, they were really like seen as like the scum of their culture. So what they would do is they would collect taxes for the government, but the way they earned their money was to collect on top of that. Sounds fun, right? So if you were supposed to be taxed at 20%, they would try to tax you at 30% so that that's how they earned their income. So they were seen as ripping off their own people, which essentially they were. But if you can imagine, they were, they were pretty hated, right? Like, you think you have problems with the IRS now? Imagine if they were, like, super shady as well. Like, you'd have even more, like, you'd be like, man, they're taking so much of my money. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's the amen part. Okay. Um, so if you can imagine this, right, imagine this group of people. He's sitting with people that are just like this kind of generic, the sinners. Everyone looks at them and says they're doing stuff wrong. And the tax collectors that everyone hated. This is like who Jesus hangs out with. It's kind of a crazy, crazy dinner. Like, I, I wonder, like, what conversation was talked about. But anyway, when the Pharisees saw this, so the teachers of the law again, right, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, right, because they're, they're too scared to talk to Jesus. He just read their thoughts, so they're a little bit nervous. So they asked his disciples, why does your teacher... Eat with tax collectors and sinners. See, something instantly rubs against them, right? Like something instantly is like, "Ah, I can't take this in my spirit. Like why of all people would you want to hang out with them? Jesus, he sits 
and he eats with the sinners, the very ones that we ourselves judge. You see, this is like one of the things about the churches. We love like the comparison game, right? Like I know I got junk in my life, but if I can compare it to them, I'm doing pretty good. Like I'm doing pretty good. And that's what we do, right? Like we love to compare, and this is exactly what the Pharisees are doing. You think the Pharisees had zero sin in their life? No. But they can compare. And they can say, really them? Jesus, that is who you're going to associate with. The very ones that we judge. He's eating dinner with the same people that did the things that we did last week. He's eating dinner with people that have done things in our lives that we are ashamed of, that we never want to talk about, that we keep hidden because it's like that thing that we're like, man, I hope no one ever sees that part of my life. Jesus was sitting and eating with them, hitting out, conversing. They probably bro-hugged like it was a good time. Like this is Jesus. The ones who who party and get drunk, the ones who look at porn, who steal, manipulate, who lie, who cheat on their husband. Like, this is who he's hanging out with. And see, it's so easy. We look at the Pharisees and we go, man, what a bunch of idiots. Didn't he just read their mind? Like, why would they even go against that? But if Jesus came back and this is the people that he was hanging out with, would we not say similar things and say, Jesus, why don't you want to grab coffee with me? Like, look look how much I'm following the law. You really want to hang out with him? She just cheated on her husband, bro. You're going to go hang out with her? Man, he steals from his own people. You're going to go hang out with him? Man, that dude shoots up all the time. He's just a druggie. You're going to go hang out with him? He can't even, like, make coherent sentences. Why would you want to sit and talk with him, Jesus? Why not me? We love to criticize They're doing all the things that we have done in our life. Many of us can experience some of those things, whether it was lying or cheating or gossiping or looking at stuff that we shouldn't or saying stuff that we shouldn't or watching stuff, whatever. Like we know what that feels like to sin, right? To do junk. And this is exactly who he sits with, yet the Pharisees, they just criticize him for it. But Jesus begins to bless the sinners begins to love them. This is who Jesus hangs out with. This is what he does. And I think this is like one of the biggest things that we miss in the church. It is not about good people or bad people. It is about dead people and alive people. That is what matters. Jesus is not interested in making you a good person. He's interested in making you alive again. He's interested in taking things that are death in your life, whether it's shame or hurt or pain or addictions. He's interested in taking that death and making you come alive again. And we think it's about bad to good. We miss it. Because this is what the Pharisees, what they can see with their eyes, they can see whether they're bad or whether they're good, and that's how they judge. They totally miss the heart of whether that person is dead and Jesus is trying to bring them out of the tomb. We miss it. I mean, some of us have missed this in our own lives. Can I tell you, can I come here today and tell you that some of us are dead inside? Man, if this is you and you've walked around with some shame, right? Maybe there are some things in your life that you're like, man, if I could go back, I would change it, but it's too late. And you carry the weight of that. Or maybe there's things that are in your life and you feel like no matter what you do, you can't break it. And you keep going back to that well over and over and over again. And you hate it. It destroys you. It breaks something in you. It hurts you. Man, can I tell you that there is a God that wants to take that death and bring you back to life? It's not about bad to good. But this is what they're caught up in. He does this. And and Matthew 9 is probably one of the most interesting chapters. And we don't have time to just dive into the whole thing, I wish. But it's very interesting. Right after this, so imagine this. He goes and he heals a paralyzed man. The second that's over, he goes to dinner with a bunch of sinners. Immediately after that, a woman comes up to him in the crowd. A woman that had been bleeding for years. That's a bad day. 
And she says, man, if I can just touch him. And she just touches his cloak. And he looks behind him, which is crazy. Can you even imagine that? The Son of God looks behind him and sees someone that needs help. And he heals her. He places a hand on her and he heals her. Right after that, someone else comes running up to him. They said, my daughter is dead. She's back at the house. I need you to go back. I need you to do this. And he's like, okay, I'll come with you. And he goes back to the house. And he says, don't even worry. She's just sleeping, which is kind of funny. He says, don't even worry. She's just sleeping. It's like a, like a relaxation thing for the parents or something. Don't worry, I got this. She's cold to the touch, but she's just sleeping. And he touches her. She comes back to life. Right after that, they bring two blind men to him. Because now word is spreading that Jesus is here and Jesus heals. And if you can just encounter Jesus, your life is forever changed. So they bring two blind men to him. And he touches them. And they're healed. As soon as that is done, they bring a demonic man. They bring someone that is demon-possessed, which would be scary. And Jesus just cast out the demon because Jesus does what Jesus does. And he cast out the demon. One thing after another. Can you imagine, like, being Jesus and this is your day? I can't, right? Like, I can't even imagine that. Like, how draining that must be, right? The line for people needing healing is so huge. The line for people that need protection is so huge. The line for people that need blessing is so huge. And it kind of leads up to this moment with Jesus and his disciples, because if you can imagine some of the tension that must have taken place as the disciples just stand by and watch. There's never a moment where they engage. It's all Jesus. And it's almost like he's like, why is no one else helping? And he says this in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He's telling everyone the gospel, healing every disease and sickness. Everyone that he saw, he healed. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And this, to me, is like one of the most interesting sentences. See, ministry, it's about the most difficult thing you can do. It's about the most grinding thing that you can do emotionally. And spiritually. Like, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. Brett knows exactly what it feels like. But there's something about ministry and constantly being there for people and constantly doing whatever it takes that drains you, right? It is not easy. There's something about it that you just go home at night and you're like, I just want to relax. I just want to do nothing. And then your phone rings and you shoot to wherever you need to go. Right? I, I know what it's like to be laying in bed at 2.30 in the morning and one of the guys calls me because his garage is burning down, and I'm like, okay, I'll throw a shirt on and be there. I'm throwing a shirt on, and I'm shooting over there. Or one of the guys is calling me at 1.30 in the morning. He's like, man, I don't know what's going on. My head's all over the place. I just want to go get smashed. I just want to go get drunk. Like, can you be here for me? I'm like, sure, I'll put a shirt on and run there, you know. And Just stay on the phone. Just stay on the phone, bro. I got you, you know. There's, like, no rest for the weary. And this is like the most amazing part about Jesus is he should be wiped at this point. In fact, I guarantee you that he is. This has taken everything out of him. He's healed people. He's defended people. He's cast out demons. But when he looks at them, there's not a moment where he goes, man, I just really want to go home right now. I think I'm done. He looks at them and he has compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless. He understood what was going on in their hearts, and he says, man, I got you. I get it. I'm, I'm worn out. I'm tired, but I am there for you. He says they're, they're harassed and they're helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. And then he says this to his disciples. Just so interesting. If you can imagine this, imagine them walking around all day. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And if you read this chapter through, it's really interesting, because literally as soon as one is ending— it says, and in the process, two men came forward. Like, like, there's no break, right? Like, there's no Lunchables in the middle of there of like, man, I just need like a second to myself, right? Nobody's calling Domino's Pizza. It's like nonstop that he's doing this. One after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And his disciples do nothing. 
Can you imagine what this must have been like? Can you imagine this tension? Here's Jesus completely worn out. And the men that he is trying to teach how to do this are doing nothing. And he looks at them. And he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. See, there is a huge line for people that needed healing. There's a huge line for people that needed blessing. There's a huge line for people that needed defending. The line for the people that were willing to help was short. And I want you to think about that because that means that people were getting healed, people were getting saved, their lives were forever changed. But none of them were walking to the line willing to help. They all just went home. And I think this is reality for many people in the church. Is we have experienced something great. We have had our lives changed. Addictions have fallen away. Things that have haunted us for years have been squashed. And we have this miracle. We experience God. He puts his hand on us. We experience it. And we walk away. And we're totally cool with just coming to church. We're totally cool with reading our Bible plan every so often. And somehow we think that's good enough. And I feel like Jesus looks at us and goes, don't you realize the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's few of us that are willing to do anything about it. Do you not see this line for people that need healing? Do you not get it? Sorry, I probably, he probably thought I was going to like do like a really lovey-dovey message for my last one. But, you know, that's how that is. Prophets don't come to tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> come to tell you what you need to hear. Like, there is a harvest out there. And we sit in here and we say, God, thank you for our blessing. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for what you've done in my life. And I feel like he's looking at us and going, that's great. I'm so glad that I could do that for you. Can you go into the field now? Can you work? Can you step in line to put your hands on someone else to heal them? Can you be willing to step into the life of someone else that is hurting and broken and wounded? Can you do that? Jesus is calling us to something greater than simply experiencing our own healing. He's calling us to harvest a world, to share this good news, this announcement. See, I don't think that this announcement simply ends when we hear it and it's changed us. I think we're called to share that story with others. I think even that phrase, the harvest is plentiful, is so interesting. Like he calls the world a harvest. Have you ever thought about that? Like every type of people, Democrats, he calls them a harvest. Republicans, he calls them a harvest. The racist, he calls them a harvest. Those that bomb our bridges and run over our people, he calls them a harvest. Do we get that? He calls everyone, the fathers, the mothers, the drug dealers, the philanthropists, and the thieves. He calls them all a harvest, everyone. It's the greatest story ever. And we forget it. We like to do nothing and stand by and criticize. But I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that story. Uh, can you turn to Romans 5? Romans 5. I remember reading this for the first time, if you can imagine. A newly converted atheist, right? <laughs> like, I remember reading these verses, how much it caught me off guard. I hope for, for just a second you can just, you can just take this in. Maybe you've read this a million times. I don't care. Let this be like a new time. Hear it for the first time. Hear it for those around you. Hear it for your city. Hear it for your family. Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, what did Jesus call them earlier? He called them the harassed and the helpless. 
While we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. According to Romans earlier, that is everyone, because we have all fallen short of the glory of God for the ungodly. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous person. Meaning, there are times that you would die for your wife, right? You would die for your husband. You would die for your, your mom, your dad. Some of us in here, we have a, a huge calling as firemen and police officers. You would, you would give yourself for someone else. But that's a rare thing, right? Rarely will someone die for someone else. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, other translations will say, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Any of y'all willing to die for your enemy? No, you probably wish hell for them, right? You're like, Christ died for those that would spit in his face. Christ died for those that would reject him. Christ died for those that do not live their life right. See, that's where we get this whole thing, we get the good and the bad mixed up. And we go, no, you're a racist. You're off the table. No, 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 you've done this. You, you've committed adultery. You're off the table. Oh, no, you've done this. You're off the table. Christ died for everyone. When we get that, we realize this is why the harvest is so big. Because we see a harvest that looks just like us. We don't see a harvest that includes everyone. This is where Jesus is looking. And this is why this is the greatest story that can ever be told. The gospel. A God that was willing to come to us. It says in John 1 that, that he took on flesh and blood and he dwelled among us. A God that gave up deity when he saw sin enter the world and he saw that we couldn't help ourselves, right? We were helpless and we were powerless. We couldn't do it on our own. Death was on the doorstep. And he enters the world. He takes on flesh and blood, and he lives like we live. He experiences what we experience. He experiences all the hurt, all the pain, all the betrayal, the highs and the lows, friends that would stab him in the back. He knew what it all felt like. And he lived a sinless life so that he could die for us while we didn't know him, while we were enemies. I imagine him up on this cross as he's getting ready to die and he's looking out at soldiers thinking, this is for you. You just nailed my hand in, but this is for you, bro. You don't even get it. This is how much I love you. I'll let you nail my hand in. I'm willing to die for you. I took all your hurt, all your pain, all of your shame, everything that you think you have to walk with. And he died with it so that you didn't have to. The story doesn't end there, though. He rose again. Paul says, we're alive in him because of this. See, we go from dead to alive. This is the greatest story ever. This is the story that when I heard this, it took my atheist heart and it completely changed it to where I said, this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. But I don't care where I have to go. Little did I know at the time that would be 1,900 miles away. I said, God, I don't care where I go. Use whatever you need to use, man. If you want me on a stage, I'll be on a stage. If you want me in a gutter, I'll be in a gutter. If I have to sell my cars, I'll sell my car. I don't care. I just want people to hear this story because there are people out there that haven't heard it, that a God would do that for them. Have you ever thought about that? In Revelation 1, it says that he holds the stars in his right hand. That means he set down stars so that he could touch your life. How big is that God? We minimize him. We make him so small. I think this is like the problem so often in Christianity and so often in the American church. So we turn it into like a narcissistic gospel and it becomes a gospel of self-importance for us. Suddenly not a gospel for everyone. Suddenly not a gospel for the adulterer. It's suddenly not a gospel for the man that's addicted to porn. It's suddenly not a gospel for the homeless. It's suddenly not a gospel for those that have stolen and, and hurt us. It's a gospel for us. We make it only about us. But the gospel shouldn't stop with what God has done for you. 
It should continue with what he's done through you. See, we need to be getting back in line. We need to say, God, I'm not just going home, but I will stand next to you. And as people come in and they need prayers and they need healings, I will extend my hand along with you because I know the power that you have. I know what you've done in my life, and I'm going to see it happen in others. Why do we keep going home? Why do we stay there? I've been thinking about this so much. To get ready to leave, and I, I, it's crazy. Like, I don't know how else to explain it. Except we're moving from a place that is so incredibly comfortable. Des Moines is comfortable, and it is awesome, and I love Des Moines. There's so much cool stuff here. There's so many cool people. It's, it's an awesome place. It's very comfortable. We're moving from Des Moines with everything that we've known to move to, like, one of the most expensive cities in the country, which freaks me out. I shop at Goodwill. Actually, today I got a new outfit, though, because my, uh, my wife said I could get a new outfit for the last time I speak, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to go to Goodwill, huh? But usually I go to Goodwill, right? Like, like so for me, in my mindset, to go to a place that's three times more expensive, I'm like, that doesn't, God, are you sure? Like, there's other places. It seems crazy. I'm still waiting for a job. I still don't have a job up there. Like, it's, it's crazy in the natural. It doesn't make sense. But this is why I'll go. Romans 15. Romans 15, 17 through 21. I think Paul says some of the most amazing words. If you've never read Romans in general, it's such a good book. It's actually the first book that, that I read when I became a Christian was Romans which led to sometimes even more questions, but Romans is an intense book. If you've never read Romans, just read it through. I think it takes like an hour to read it through, maybe not even that much. It says this. This is Paul's words, and he says, Therefore, I glorify Christ in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. And leading others to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way to Ikram, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. His whole goal is to tell others the story. He says you've got to hear what God has done for us. You are not dead. You are not alone. You don't have to just carry your shame. You don't have to feel this way. But there's a God that can make you come alive. There's a God that gave up his deity to come amongst us, to overcome sin and death so that you don't have to. Why do you keep trying to fulfill yourself and all this stuff? There's a God that fulfills you. He's like, I have to tell the story. And it says this, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So that I would not be building on someone else's foundation, rather as it is written, Those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. There are people all around us that have never heard this story. There are people in cities all around us that have never experienced what we experience. I mean, I love Sunday mornings. Like, one of my favorite times ever is worship. One of my favorite times, you probably watch me, I'm weird, whatever, man, I don't even care. Like, it is like one of my favorite times ever, because I, I, that's like one of those times that I just feel God more than ever. Any of you guys kind of like that? No, it's supposed to be when I'm speaking. What are you guys doing? Put your hands down. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But for real, like, that's one of the times that I just, I can feel God, and I can sense God, and I was like, man, you're, I feel like you're all around me right now. There's something so powerful in that. And we forget that there's so many that have never experienced that. See, for me, that's what changed my life forever. When an atheist walked into a church, music started playing. He ended up on his knees bawling. Because he experienced God. There's so many people around us that have not experienced God. I think this is why God called us to where he called us. I don't know if you realize this, but Portland is actually, it's second on the list. It's the second least church city in all of the country. So the ratio of churches to people, it is second on the list for having the least. Is that not crazy? 
In fact, it was really interesting when we were up there in June and you're talking to a bunch of these pastors. They used to be number one on the list. They used to be the least church city in all of the country. And they are, they are proud. They feel like they've won a battle because they're second now. Like, how crazy is that? This is what we're getting ready to walk into. I've been thinking about this, and this is what keeps coming back to my mind again and again, is, God, I want to go where people haven't heard it. I want to go where people haven't experienced it. I want to walk into a land that people say is not yours, and I want to claim it for you. I want to walk into a place that says healings are not possible and watch healings happen. I want to walk into a place that says prayer is not real. It's a crutch made up by the church and watch prayers come to life. Like, I want to see that in a culture that doesn't know it. Like, how crazy would that be? Man, would that not be something to get excited about? I, like, my prayer, can I tell you, like, my prayer is that when I come back in June, I can go, guys, we're third on the list. Like, that's my hope, right? Like, like, I want it to be a change. I want to see what happens there because I think that there's a huge harvest and something we haven't even seen. There's about two and a half million people in Portland, which is crazy because it's like five times bigger than Des Moines. It's huge. But 42% of that population will identify as religiously unaffiliated. What that term essentially means is they believe in some sort of deity, that there could be some sort of God, some sort of presence, some sort of spirit. But you don't have to believe in that God or follow his ways in order to be a good person or in order to get to heaven. Like, this is like the crux of, like, the coexist movement. This is Portland. Everything's cool. Everything's great. Do what you're going to do. Everything will be fine. Like, that is Portland. That's what we're walking into. 1.8 million. Think about this. And they estimate. That's like the higher end of the estimate. So something 1.2 to 1.8 million. Do not attend a religious gathering of any kind. I'm not just talking about Christian. Any kind, right? Everything from like Greek Orthodox to Buddhism. 1.8 million. How crazy is that? Most people have no interest in it at all. But there's such a need there. Right now, as we sit here today, there's 14,000 homeless on the street of Portland. 14,000. It's crazy. I've experienced it. It is so weird because it's such a beautiful city. It's such a gorgeous city. And you're walking by, and every corner has these little tent community things. Noah's shaking his head because we've seen it, right? We've seen it. It's crazy. I've never experienced anything like it in my life. I remember there was a time that, that me and my wife, we went to go get some food at one of the food trucks. And we sit down in like this little park area in downtown Portland, right? Like right in the midst of all this. And we're getting ready to eat our, I think it was Chinese. We're getting ready to eat our Chinese. And I look over, there's a girl and she takes it, the syringe out of her and she plucks it right in and falls over. I'm like, oh my gosh, we just saw someone OD. Like, what are we, <laughs> like, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. You know, like, and she ends up getting up and we're like, okay, oh, oh my gosh, okay. This is like watching Law and Order on her right in front of us. It's crazy. The need is so great. Like, can we comprehend that? 14,000 are on the streets right now. They actually have the second highest unsheltered homeless population in the country. That means most of them, if you pick up on that, most of them don't have like a shelter building to go into at night. Most of them just live on the street with one of those little blue tarp things over their head. This is the kind of stuff, man, that should break our heart. Hmm? Right? I got a new outfit today. I'm pumped about my new outfit. They sleep in the dirt over a blue tarp. Can you imagine that? They're actually number one in the country for families unsheltered and homeless. They have the most children on the street of anywhere in the country. Can you imagine that? It's like this great eyesore in Portland that, that everybody is so loving and so accepting. It's such a beautiful city. And you walk past the homeless thing, you just kind of kind of don't look. That's the reality of the place. 
See, I think these are the exact type of people that Jesus would have had around his dinner table. And I think people of the city would have looked at him and go, why them, Jesus? Are you kidding me? She's shooting up at the table, Jesus. He's like, I don't care. I want them to feel my love. I want them to know that I care about them. I want them to know that they are more than just a stat. I want them to know that they are more than just someone that sleeps on the street. I want them to know that they are created being by me. In Ephesians, he says, we are his masterpiece. He looks at us after he finishes as an artist and says, this is my masterpiece. We're so quick to criticize. We're so quick to judge. See, when we hear the gospel, it should affect us. It should affect us in such a way that we're willing to give up everything to tell others about it. And like, that's the point. I, I remember me and Noah even had this conversation. Like, that's the point that I've hit in my life. It's like, I like my car. I li- it's fun. It's a good car. It's like electric. It's kind of cool. It fit in Portland really well. If I had to sell my car to get someone off the street, I would. No, it's like, I'll do the same thing, man. If I had to sell my car, I'd sell my car. How does the gospel influence us? Does it really change us? Does it really motivate us to such a huge extent? Does it change everything? See, here's the reality is I'm getting ready to go to Portland. I think Portland is a harvest. I think there are so many hurting and broken people there. I think the reason that the coexist movement works is because no one actually wants to talk about all the crap that's going down inside. We just put on a face. Hey, it's cool if you're cool. I'm cool. We're good. But there's so many broken and hurting people there. You know how I know? Because they let 14,000 lay on the streets. See, broken people allow other people to be broken. Hurting people allow others to be hurting. People that are healed want to heal others. People that have been saved want to save others. That tells me that there is so much brokenness there. There is so much hurt there. The harvest is huge. And we're going to be the workers. I don't know what that looks like. I know it's going to be hard. It's going to be crazy. I'll dig my ditch. I don't care. We're going to do what we got to do. But can I tell you something? Portland isn't the only harvest. Des Moines is a harvest. Des Moines has broken and hurting people. Do you guys remember when I I did a message a while ago where I talked about the sex trafficking that happens in Iowa? We talked about the homeless that happens in Iowa. We talked about the suicide rate that happens in Iowa. You guys remember that? Dude, there's some broken and hurting people here. We got to get in line. We got to say, I'm not just going home anymore. But Jesus, if you need a worker, here I am. If you need someone to work with their hands, here I am. If you need someone to work with their mouth, here I am. If you need someone to just hear someone else's stories, here's my ears. Are we willing to be those people? Can I tell you something? Can I just, can I just be honest with you? It's my last week. Can I be honest with you? You know why there's such a big harvest? Because there's no laborers. See, if people were laboring, that field shrinks. Because it's being harvested. The reason you can look at Des Moines and you can see so many people that are hurting and so many people that are broken and so many people that desperately need something real in their lives is because we're not working. We go home, we take our blessing, we take our healing, we say, thank you, Jesus, and we sit in our house. We come back on Sunday, we come back on Wednesday, we just repeat. What would happen, guys? New point, what would happen to Des Moines if we started doing city reach every week, if that was our mindset every week? It wasn't like this thing that we built up, but it was like, man, we just want to do whatever we can for our city. I mean, I will, I will, I will talk to the person at Starbucks. I will talk to the person at Target. I will do whatever it takes. What happens if we became those people? 
Man, can I tell you, can I tell you, can I tell you today, there would be a harvest getting harvested and not just sitting there, right? You would see amazing things happen. This is what Jesus says in Luke 19, 10. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Do we do the same? Are we just happy when we've been sought after? Are we just happy when we've been saved? Or does our mindset change? Do we say, man, I was the paralyzed man that Jesus healed, and I want to see other paralyzed men get healed. Man, I was the woman that was addicted to pornography, and I want to go and see other women have that broken. Man, I was the man that used to cheat and manipulate and steal from everyone around me. Man, I want to be the person that goes and sees those people come to Christ. Are we willing to do that? Des Moines is a harvest. Portland is a harvest. Who will be the workers? Who will be the laborers? Who are the ones that are willing to go out and do it? And I can tell you, as, as I get ready to leave, I mean, you got a, a pastor here that would do anything for you. I've, we've been together for what, eight years now? Eight years we've done ministry together. And I, I can tell you, honestly, um, just about everything I know from a ministry perspective, like I've learned from this man, right? I've learned how to serve. I've learned how to care about people. Uh, when I came and I hooked up with Brett, I was, a, I was like a, a mega church pastor. That was, I was all about numbers. That was my thought pattern. Brett told me how to be like relational. He taught me how to like actually be in people's lives and love them. Actually, I, I wasn't even planning on sharing the story, but I'll share the story because I think it's kind of cool. It gives you kind of a cool insight into the man. But I remember uh, when I first moved up here, and I had moved from, like, this really large church. So I kind of had that mindset, right? And I remember we had two campuses at the time. And Brett was like, hey, I need you to come up to our Pleasant Hill campus. We got some stuff we got to do. I was like, okay, cool. And so we ride up there. And all of a sudden, we go into the bathroom. Brett gets, like, on his back and starts changing out this toilet. And I'm like, no, bro. <laughs> that's all you. And he's like, no, I need your help. And I was like, no, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's gross, dude. No way. No way. And I remember he looked at me and he said, dude, if you can't serve here, you'll never be able to serve on stage. So you have influences in your life. Brett is someone that has influenced me for a long time, right? I'm not saying he's perfect. We all have our struggles. But if there's ever a man that will run into the field and start harvesting, carrying other people on his back that probably don't want to walk to the field. It's this man. What influences us? Let's be a people that the gospel influences our lives so dramatically that we have to tell others about it. Let's be people that the gospel influences our lives so drastically that it influences the lives of those around us. They want to become workers. They want to go out into the field. I can tell you when, when I came eight years ago, if someone had said Portland, I would have said, nah. <laughs> like, I ain't going that far. I ain't got that much faith, right? Like, I'm just being honest. Like, I, I can't do it. But I've watched someone that has had faith through some of the roughest times, right? Has been there. What? influences us in our life? Is it the gospel or is it just stuff? Because if it's the gospel, our world should look so much different. The fields around us should look so much different. Our families should look different. Our cities should look different. Our nations should look different. So we think so small. Even when Jesus, when he said his last little bit, right? He said, go into all the nations. He didn't even just limit it to cities. He said, man, you're after nations. Our nations would look different. Can we be those type of people? Can we be workers? 
Amen. Church, can you do it with me? All right. Let's pray. God, I pray for everyone in this room. God, I pray for those of us that have walked in here. We've walked in here with some hurts. Yeah, we've walked in here with some pain. We've walked in here with some junk. We've walked in here with things that we have carried our entire lives or our most shameful spots. God, I pray that in this moment, we would feel you begin to bring that stuff back to life, that you would squash the death and you would bring us back to life. God, for those of us that are in here, that we have given our lives to you, we have given our hearts to you. God, I pray that we can also give our hands now. We can give our time, we can give our energy, we can say we will be workers in the harvest, we will be workers in the field. God, give us that motivation, give us that dream, give us that heart. Let us be people that actually go out into our city and harvest what is around us. To see people come to you, the hurting and the broken, God, give us eyes, give us hearts for that. In your name, amen. Oh, I tell you, I love this guy. Amen. 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 I love you, buddy. I love you too. Uh, I tell you, it's been a, uh, and and again, I truly do believe that uh, that even though we're going to be apart, this is about kingdom expansion. And, and what God is going to do in Portland. And you have what it takes, bro. You do. Because even in all those moments when we were journeying together, um, you, were, you were also living by faith. And you moved to the Des Moines area, and you came and lived in our basement. <laughs> and uh, How many girls did you have there at the time? This, a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot of girls. And, and, uh, and, I, and, for several years, you worked and didn't get a dime to do to do the work of the ministry for a lot of years, and you trusted God all along the way, and there's a lot of people that wouldn't do that. They wouldn't work a full-time job and then do ministry full-time, but we did it side by side, and so it's inside of you and God's hand is on you, and you have grown as a minister of the gospel, and you have a love for people, and his, his word is inside you, and his power is inside you. It's never about you. It's about him inside of you, and, and the faith that you have. And, and I, I, want, I want you to know something, that in the end, it's not always about uh, how talented you think you are at whatever you are talented at. It, it, all, it always comes down to, will you stay the course? Because there are moments that you don't feel like staying the course, but you keep on and you keep on. And you're going to have moments. I'm telling you, you will have moments. All of you will have moments in Portland that it's going to seem like what in the world is happening. Stay faithful to his call. Stay on your knees and pray. This church is praying with you. And, and slowly but surely, there will be a breakthrough. And you will connect with that first family. You connect with that person who needed Jesus. And you'll touch that person on the street. And you'll see that drug addict get saved and come off of that stuff and get addicted to Jesus. You will see those things happen. Stay faithful to it. Don't quit. Don't give up. It's already in you. I've watched it. And he's going to complete it. That which he has started. He who began a good work in you, he's going to complete that work. He's going to complete that work. So, uh, pray with me one more time. Uh, real quickly, as we're praying, deacons, would you come? We're going to take communion. Uh, so you can come now as we pray. Would you just extend your hands towards Pastor Wes? And at, at the same time, when we're done here, would you love on him? Would you love uh, on Chelsea, on Noah, on Julia? I don't see, where's Chelsea at? I don't see her. Okay, there she is. I was looking for you the whole time. I, and Love on them and let them know how much you care about them. Let's pray for this man of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for... Uh, the progression of faith. I thank you that 
we stand here today because there were faithful men and women in the New Testament who carried the torch. They didn't quit. They moved forward. They believed you, even in times of pain in times of trouble, they kept moving forward. Even when it came to losing their life, they pushed the gospel forward, the good news of Jesus Christ, that today we could stand here with that same gospel, that same good news inside of us that we were once lost, but now we're found, that we once had no path uh, anywhere, but now you have given us a path to eternity because, God, you loved us so much, you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, and he took our sins on himself why we were still enemies so we don't want to get uh, healed and touched and go home but God I pray that this is a church because of this message and because of the heart of this man and the other ministers in this church and and the deacons and the leaders and everyone here that we would never go home but we would stay faithful because you've healed us all And we'd get back in line. And we'd stand there with you, Jesus, and say, whoever needs healing, we want to pray for them. We want to love them. We know the harvest is plentiful. I pray that Des Moines has more workers than ever before. And I pray that because of this man and his family and those who will serve with him, that Portland will continue to shrink on that list, that that they will continue to, to find more and more people that love Jesus and more churches are planted because of the faith of a man who would go to a place that is an unchurched place. I pray your anointing upon him that when he speaks your word, it wouldn't be him speaking, but it'd be the Holy Spirit through him. And that the gospel would be proclaimed and a light would be seen all across this nation. Do something crazy, God, in Portland, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.